Okay, so welcome to this next video in the playlist on functional analysis. In this video, what we're going to prove is that the complex plane is complete. So, uh, the complex... oh dear. The complex plane is complete is the topic for this video. And we're going to use what we've um, seen in the um, previous videos about uh, limits in the complex plane and their relation to limits of uh, the um, uh, sequences of the real and imaginary components, which are just sequences of real numbers. Okay, uh, so uh, if we want to prove that the complex plane is complete, then what we need to prove is that any Cauchy sequence in the complex plane uh, converges to a limit within the complex plane. So here is the complex plane uh, with the usual metric on it. So it's the complex numbers with the usual metric, the um, uh, metric that the distance between any two complex numbers z and w is just the complex modulus function of z minus w. Okay, so let's say we have some sequence uh, x of complex numbers, which is x1, x2, x3, etc. And these are all complex numbers, so if I draw it out, it looks something like this, x1, x2, x3, etc. Right, and it's Cauchy. We're going to assume X is a Cauchy sequence. Is a Cauchy sequence. Okay, and we want to prove uh, that it is a convergent sequence. Uh, so, uh, it being Cauchy, uh, let's, uh, um, let's um, you know, uh, pick out what that actually means. That means that for all epsilon greater than zero, there exists some big N, which is an element of the natural numbers, uh, such that if a little n and little m are greater than or equal to big N, it implies that the uh, modulus of x little n, sorry, minus x little n, is less than epsilon. So basically, you give me any epsilon you like, I will find you some x big N, which is an element, a term of this sequence, such that if you pick any two terms, any two uh, terms of the sequence that are beyond uh, that big N, so any little n and any little m, which are greater than or equal to big N, so if you pick any little x n and any little x m over here, which are to the uh, right of this term x big N, and then you take uh, the distance between them, it's going to be less than epsilon. And that goes for whatever choices of x little n and x little m you pick uh, that are to the left, or, uh, that are to the right, sorry, of x big n. Okay, uh, so that's what it means for it to be Cauchy. Now, how are we going to prove uh, that um, this implies that it converges to uh, a point in the complex plane? Well, the way we're going to do it is we're going to say, okay, uh, we know that we can write this sequence of complex numbers as a sequence. Uh, we can split each complex number down into its real plus its imaginary components. We can split it up into a1 plus ib1, a2 plus ib2, a3 plus ib3. We also know that if this sequence converges, if this sequence converges, then the sequence of uh, the well, the, this sequence will converge if and only if the sequence of um, the sequence of real components. That's what we proved in the previous three videos. That uh, this sequence of complex numbers will converge to a limit within the complex plane if and only if the sequence of uh, real of the real components of these complex numbers and the sequence of the ra imaginary components of these real of these complex numbers uh, converge to a limit respectively. So let's say this one converges to L1 and this one converges is to L2. So if these two converge to limits, then this will converge, and if this converges, these two will converge. So it's if and only if, basically. If these converge, this converges, and that the only way this can converge is if these two converge. So what we need to prove is that these two things converge, basically. Now, uh, and then obviously this sequence here will converge to L1 plus IL2, which we proved in the previous video. So the uh, real part, the real portions converge to L1, the imaginary portions converge to L2, so the overall sequence converges to L1 plus IL2. It's pretty intuitive. Uh, right, so uh, what we're given is that this sequence is Cauchy. So we somehow have to get that these two sequences here are going to converge because this is Cauchy. But well, what we know is that the real line is a complete metric space. So we know that any Cauchy sequence of real numbers is going to converge to a limit. So if we could prove that this being Cauchy, i.e. this sequence here being Cauchy, implies that these two sequences are Cauchy, then that implies that these two sequences 
sequences, which are sequences of real numbers, converge to some limits in the real numbers, and then if those two converge to limits, then it implies that this entire sequence converges to the limit L1 plus IL2. So in fact, all we need to show is that these two sequences here are Cauchy uh, in the real line, in the uh, real line sense, in the real line, if uh, this is Cauchy in the complex numbers. And that sh shouldn't be too difficult, basically. Right, so what do we need to do we, uh, to show that this sequence here is Cauchy? So let's start with the sequence A. So A1, A2, A3. If we're going to show it's Cauchy, we need to show that um, if you give me an epsilon, I can find you some A, let's say, uh, big G, uh, such that if you go beyond that point, if you pick two points, A little g and A little h, let's say, that are beyond that point A big G, then uh, the distance, the absolute value of them uh, of AG minus AH needs to be less than epsilon basically. For whatever epsilon you give me, I need to be able to find your point in the sequence such that if you take any two terms of the sequence after that point and take how far they are away, which of course in the real line is just the um, the absolute value of their difference, uh, then uh, that needs to be less than epsilon. And I need to be able to find your point for whatever epsilon, okay? Uh, so that's what I need to do. So let's say let epsilon be greater than zero. So let's take an arbitrary epsilon and prove that we can do this. Okay, let epsilon be greater than zero. What we know is that this sequence of complex numbers is Cauchy. So, what we can do is say, okay, um, we have this sequence of complex numbers. Uh, because it's Cauchy, we can find, I can find, there exists some big M, which is an element of the natural numbers, such that uh, if little n and little m are greater than or equal to big N, it implies that the absolute value of xn minus xm, uh, the modulus of that is less than epsilon. So basically, I'm saying, okay, go back to the original sequence, the sequence of complex numbers, x1, x2, x3, etc., uh, of which this sequence is the real components, remember, and I can find you some a big n, uh, sorry, x big n, that should be, uh, such that if I take any two terms of the sequence that are beyond x big n, so let's say x little n and x little m, uh, there Abs the modulus of their difference is less than epsilon. But, and that works for whatever two you pick here, but we know how to compute this uh, complex modulus. What we do is we split these two things into their real and imaginary components. So uh, we will write xn as an plus ibn, because it's a complex number, so we can split it into its real and imaginary components. And we can write xm as an uh, plus ibn, basically. And then we take the... Uh, Oh dear, what have I done? Uh, yes, we're taking the, com the modulus of that, the, and the way that you compute it is you say, okay, take the difference between the two, uh, take the difference between the two uh, real parts, which is am minus am, the modulus of that, square it, add it to the difference between the two uh, imaginary parts, which is bn minus bm, square that, and then take the square root of it. That's just the formula for how to take the complex modulus of the, uh, the well, how to take the modulus of a complex number. Basically, you take its real part uh, and um, square that. Uh, you add it to the imaginary part, square that, and then square root it. So. The real part of this complex number in here is an minus am, and the imaginary part is bn minus bm. So that's exactly what we've done here. Okay, uh, right. Uh, but uh, remember that this was equal to this. That was uh, we all we did is expanded those into their real and imaginary parts. But this is strictly greater than or equal to an. Uh, sorry, no. What have I done? I've written it the wrong. Wrote it the written it the wrong way around. So this this. Uh, value here, this modulus of xm minus xm, is strictly greater than or equal to the modulus of an minus an, basically. Uh, because this number here is non-negative. So what you're going to be doing is you're going to be taking the square root of a bigger number, a number that is bigger than the modulus of an minus an squared. Because you're at the very least, you're going to add on zero, or you're going to add on a positive number. If you add on zero, obviously this just remains as modulus of an minus am squared, and when you square root it, you just get an minus am. But all other occasions, this is going to be positive, so you're going to be taking the square root of something that's slightly bigger than the modulus of an minus am squared. So, uh, when you square root it, you're going to get something that's bigger than a modulus of an minus am. Okay, uh, so, basically, 
uh, if I assure, I can assure you that if you go beyond them and take any two points here, that the modulus of xm minus xm is less than epsilon. But this thing is less than or equal to that thing. So by transitivity of the um, order of the ordering of the um, real numbers, the modulus of an minus am must therefore be less than epsilon for all little n and little m greater than or equal to n. So basically, you pick any two points. Um, any two little n's and little m's beyond big N, and this will be true. So basically what I've done, I've just done, I've found you your big G here. Just let big G equal big N, basically, and we're done. Uh, so this is my strategy for you. If you want to prove, if you want the, if you are given an epsilon and you have to find a point uh, in the uh, sequence of these real components of this uh, sequence of complex numbers, uh, such that uh, if you take any two terms beyond that point and ask what's their, uh, what's the difference between them, the, the distance between them, the uh, absolute value of little ig minus little ih, and you want that to be less than epsilon, basically, I want uh, to prove this is the Cauchy criterion on this, uh, then all you need to do is go back into the original sequence of complex numbers, which is Cauchy, and say, uh, right, I can find you some big N, uh, such that if you take any two points beyond there, uh, the modulus of xm minus xm is less than epsilon, but this modulus, this value of, um, the di basically, if we draw little xn and little xm, this value here is the modulus of the difference between them, and the uh, value of the modulus of their the difference between their uh, real parts is this triangle length here, which is why this is all working, basically. That's the picture of why this is working. That's why this inequality holds, that this thing here is going to be less than or equal to this thing here, because that's the side of this triangle, and they're going to be equal when this other side length here um, the vertical side is going to be equal to zero. Okay, so then what we say is basically, once you've gotten to that point, I can assure you that if you take the the difference between the two um, real components, that is most definitely going to be less than or equal to the difference, the actual distance between them in, with, with regards to the full complex metric. So I can assure you that this difference, uh, this uh, distance between the um, the real components of the complex numbers is also going to be less than epsilon for all all terms beyond there. So we just let g be our n here. Similarly, we can prove uh, for the sequence uh, of um, we can prove it similarly for the sequence of imaginary components. So if we take the sequence of imaginary components, this sequence B, which is equal to B1, uh, B2 b3, etc. And I want to find you a point. Uh, I'm given an epsilon, so let epsilon be greater than zero, and I want to find a point, some b big n, uh, which, uh, it, sorry, I'll say b big h, let's say b big h. Um, I want to find some b big h, uh, which, uh, if you go beyond that term, and take any two terms from beyond that term, so let's say b little g and b little h, if you take these two terms, and take the absolute value of their difference, bj, bg minus bh, uh, b little h, uh, if you take that, uh, that's going to be uh, less than epsilon, basically. I want, uh, I want you to be able to find me a big h such that that is true, basically. Okay, uh, right, so the way that we would do that is we'd say, okay, uh, if you go back to the original sequence of complex numbers up here, then I can find you a big N such that, again, the modulus of the distance x little n and x little n is less than epsilon. So exactly the same argument, and then what we know is uh, that this m modulus of between them is this, this square root here, and we know that that square root is going to be strictly greater than or equal to the modulus of bn minus bn. So it's exactly the same argument, basically. Now what we're doing, though, is we're using this modulus of bn minus bn here, this orange thing, uh, corresponds to this side of the triangle here. So the distance between the two imaginary components. If the distance between the t both the two points in the complex plane, where you've got the real and imaginary components, is less than epsilon, then we're assured, basically, that the distance between their two imaginary per components is less than epsilon. So basically, again, I just say that uh, big H equal N, so that big H equal N, and basically I can assure you that if you go to that point, B big N, then 
if you pick any two compo in any two compo terms of this sequence here, then their distance between one another is going to be less than epsilon. The reason being that the corresponding uh, x big n, if you take any two points, uh, if you take the full complex numbers corresponding to these terms here and take their difference, that's going to be less than epsilon. And uh, the distance between the two imaginary components is assured to be less than or equal to the distance between the whole complex numbers. So basically what we've just done there is proven that uh, if the sequence x, which is a sequence of complex numbers, so I'll write them out, a1 plus i b1, a2 plus i b2, a3 plus i b3. If this sequence is Cauchy, so this is a Cauchy sequence of complex numbers, uh, then that implies that the two sequences, the sequence of real, uh, of the real components of this, uh, so the sequence a1, a2, a3, the sequence of the real components, this is a Cauchy sequence of real numbers, Cauchy sequence in R, I'll say. And uh, the sequence of imaginary components, b1, b2, b3, etc., is also Cauchy. Okay, so now all we do is apply the fact that um, the real line is complete and say, therefore, these have limits. So uh, let's say the, this sequence converges on this limit L1 and this sequence converges on the limit L2. And what we did in the previous video uh, was we showed that if these sequence converge, the, if these two sequences associated with the sequence of complex numbers, if the sequence of the real components and the sequence of the complex numbers both converge to limits in the real line, then overall this co sequence of complex numbers must converge to L1 plus IL2. And therefore what I've done is I've taken a Cauchy sequence of complex numbers found to a limit, therefore I've proven that any arbitrary Cauchy sequence of complex numbers is going to converge to a complex number L1 plus IL2. I've even shown you how to calculate it. So, uh, that's all then. That's what we've proven, therefore, is that uh, the complex plane is indeed a complete metric space.